Hey guys, Rob Skiba here for another TestingTheGlobe.com video presentation. This time it's not going to be presented by me, but rather Pastor Dean Odell. He did a video a while back showing various NASA, government, CIA, and even Russian documents that describe the Earth as a non-rotating flat Earth. And he gave a presentation but didn't show the documents in a chronological order. And maybe it's just the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder in me. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, I felt like I needed to rearrange his speech in chronological order so you could see a progression over time beginning in the 1940s and going right through to pretty close to the present time. So that's what I did. Um, I've shortened his presentation a little bit and have arranged them in chronological order. If you'd like to see his unedited presentation, I will put the link in the description below, as well as links to the documents that he's talking about and some additional ones as well. So here is the shortened and edited and chronological presentation done by Pastor Dean Odell back on June 10th, 2018. Government documents admit flat earth. Now, um, I had to leave a lot out this morning. So, I understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg. But um, just so everyone knows, those watching, listening, just so everyone knows, I've spent a lot of time digging into this, reading the actual documents, going to the actual CIA website, the Army website, the Navy website, the U.S. Air Force, uh, many, many NASA documents, Russian documents, documents from Russia that we stole from them during the Cold War. Uh, amazing, amazing things that I'm discovering here. Of course, here's what the Bible does say, and I've shared this before. I mean, this is Job 38, 14. The context is talking about the, the earth, but it says it, and that is the earth, is turned or changed, is what the Hebrew word there means, as clay to the seal or the signet ring, and they, and they stand out as a garment, talking about its features. I mean, this right here is as crystal clear as it gets about the shape of the earth. It talks about it being a lump of clay. God pressed it down with his signet ring, I believe a literal ring he has on his finger. Uh-huh. Oh, no, I believe that's a metaphor. Okay, keep believing that. You know, when does it stop? Is the crucifixion... The atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross, is that a metaphor? Is his resurrection from the dead a metaphor? Don't get me wrong, I know the Bible uses some symbolic language, but come on, folks. Yeah. And usually the symbolic language is describing something that's real anyway. So, right, exactly. Let's keep going. All right. Now, here's Revelation 20. This is something the Lord showed me a, a couple of years ago. I wasn't studying a message for flat earth, but came, I was reading this verse, preparing an, an end time Bible prophecy message. Reading this verse, Revelation 20, verses 7 and 9. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. Now, when I read this, I was like, Breath of the earth, whoa, 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 whoa. The Lord, I know, I know it was the Holy Spirit just made me pause. And the Holy Spirit made me think, said, why did he say breadth of the earth when he could have just said they went up on the earth? Why did he say breadth? So I did something in 30 years of ministry at that time that I'd never done. I looked up the word breadth of the earth. And it is the Greek word platos. Of course, here is the definition, width, breadth, and I thought, plateaus. Well, that sounds like our word, plateau, which means flat land, right? Or a flat place of land. I thought, huh, that's interesting. So then I looked and noticed it says from 4116, meaning that this word has a root word. Right? So what is the root word? The root word is plateaus. And what does platus mean? This is straight from the Strong's Greek Dictionary, by the way. Spread out flat. So what he's saying is they went up on the spread out flat earth. 
These people out here, these, these pastors, these Christians, say, it, flat earth's not in the Bible, really? Sometimes you got to look up a word because we lose a lot in English. And also the word gay or gi, or however you pronounce it, for the earth in Greek here, means the whole thing. Not just a spot, but it means the whole earth. All right, and that's, and that's exactly how the Septuagint translates it as well. So then, of course, I just kept following the path there, and there are the words. Plateaus, which comes from platus, which means spread out flat, which comes from the word plasso, which means to mold or fabricate, like a lump of clay, which takes us exactly back to Job 38, 14, lump of clay, fabricated, spread out flat. The Bible teaches the shape of the earth is flat. Not, it doesn't mean it doesn't have contour and elevation, but it's flat. It's not a ball of 25,000 miles in circumference. It just doesn't exist. Not in Scripture. Um, anyway, let's keep going. Of course, we've all seen the fake pictures of Earth. There's a NASA official image. But again, for most of us, this is elementary in this. We've already discovered this, but again, for new people watching and listening, um, they have a problem. They're telling us that these are real images of Earth. Boy, what happened? I mean, did the North America shrunk, man, right? So, so these, and then again, they admit that these images are composites. They admit that they're photoshopped. Of course, this gentleman right here who actually does it Mr. Uh, what's his name? Robert Simmon, Mr. Blue Marble. It's photoshopped, but it has to be. And of course, I, I listened to the interview where he said that. So this is not just a meme I found. I heard the guy say it he in an interview. Right. It's it's quite insane. But again, they they're listen. This. What gets me is the pastors and Christians and people that want to say if you believe in this flat Earth thing. If you believe in biblical cosmology, biblical Greek, you're stupid, you're crazy, you're a lunatic. I had a guy last night make a comment. This guy is a Christian. He said, well, why don't you just say, why don't you just say you're geocentric instead of flat earth? The moment you say flat earth, you go to the nut house. I said, I say flat earth because that's what the Bible says. I'd rather be a fool than that's right. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of what the Bible says about anything. I don't care. Um... We're going to take a little journey here, back to 1931. August Picard, scientist, friend of Albert Einstein. I've shared this. Well-respected scientist, inventor. Creates a, you know, a gondola, creates his own capsule. Takes a balloon up. The first man to reach the stratosphere. And what do we see here? That's his little porthole so he was looking out of. And this magazine right here, this man, a scientist, I have it. Let's go ahead and show it. See, I actually have the actual magazine. Now it's worth about $4,000. I bought it for $20,000. I mean, uh, $20. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my, after this, it might be worth $20,000. You never know. But anyway, there it is. I got in trouble the first time I should because I was handling it with my hands. I said, you don't handle an old document with your hands. I said, okay, okay. But what does he say here? Right here, I'll just read it. Through the portholes, he and his observer saw the earth. He said, it seemed a flat disk with upturned edge, no curve. Now this is a scientist, pre-NASA, 1931. Why did he have a reason to lie? He was a scientist. He was telling you, this is what I observe, which is real science. I'm not gonna make up a lie. I'm just going to tell you, this is what I saw. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Uh, there it is again. There, there's the, where, for, you know, so you can see where he actually said it through the portholes. The observer saw the earth through a copper colored then bluish haze. It seemed a flat disk with upturned edge. Oh, and I'm going to tell you another reason I discovered why that, that outer edge looks, it's got that little blue haze. I found out that there, there's, there's a blue vapor blue cloud that Antarctica creates. Yeah, I found that out recently. Um, but anyway, 
Here's something I recently discovered. Well, really a few months ago, but I've just been waiting to share it. How many of you know there's been a world record set? Now, I bet you didn't hear that on CNN, right? And you certainly didn't hear it from Danny Faulkner at Answers in Genesis. No, there was a little world record set. There's a company here named uh, Extend Air. This is Exalt or Extend Air, they, multiple name company here. Um, but anyway, Exalt here sets new world record for microwave length distance. Now, anybody that understands microwave, Ted probably does, some other people probably understand that microwave signals are not bounced off the dome. It's not the ionosphere. They're not bounced off. Microwave signals are line of sight, straight transmitter to receiver. Boom. All right. And that's exactly what this is. Now, what this company did and what they're trying to do is they're trying to sell their product, which is to set up these very inexpensive microwave dishes. Um, the 50 foot high towers, only 50 feet, which is your normal tree or telephone pole. They put a microwave dish there and as long as they have clear line of sight, there's no obstacles in the way, they can put another one at, at crazy distances and communicate. And that's what this is talking about. I went through, I dug through all this. Um, but they set a world record. Now, let, let, me, let me just get to this. They set a world record. I, I'm not going to read all this. I'm just showing you that I got it. See the microwave? There's, there's, the little, there's your little illustration right there. All right, that's how it works. So the world record for microwave, this microwave communications company, and, and just so you know, microwave communication says that... Uh, Finally, they can be used almost anywhere as long as the distance to be spanned is within the operating range of the equipment and there is a clear path that is no solid obstacles between the locations. You see that? There can be no solid obstacles between microwave dishes. All right? This is their own words, not mine. Clear path. All right? So they set the world record for microwave link. Now... The world record that they set. What they did, they set one of these 50 foot microwave dishes on the beach in Cyprus. And let's put that map up here. And there it is. And, and, and this guy talked to him, line of sight, making sure it's line of sight. So here's Cyprus right here. And they put one here and they put one on the coast of Lebanon. So across water. Now, I, mean, I know that they try to tell us water's got a big bulge in it, right? But I've, I've never seen bulging water. I've seen flat water, right? But 146 miles from the coast of Cyprus to the coast of Lebanon, this set a world record. It is recorded as a world record for microwave communication. Well, guess what? You do a little math. Do the math here. Let's find out if there's a solid obstacle in the way here, right? Well, here it is. 50 feet high, 146 miles. You calculate that. 12,575 feet of bulge or curvature. 12,000. How high is Everest? How high is Mount Everest? I can't remember. 14,000? Is it? Get this. The antenna... The microwave dish should be at least 2.38 miles below the line of sight. Not 2.3 feet. 2.38 miles should be is, of curve is blocking, should be blocking the signal. Meaning this signal should have to be bounced off the dome and back down like they do other signals. But no, this is straight line of sight. Okay, am I stupid? Are these people stupid? People, people and governments of the world are buying this product from this Extend, Exalt One, Extend Air company. It's refraction. It's refraction. <laughs> Gravity and refraction. Now let's get to the government documents. Throw this up right here. We went back a moment ago to scientist, inventor, Dr. Picard, 1931, pre-NASA. This document right here, as most of you will note, where did it come from up top there? The Central Intelligence Agency. 
declassified document that we stole from the Russians in, from 1948. Yes, you will, you will, <laughs> you notice that, sanitized, yes. Why would you sanitize scientific information about, look at this, this is what this one's about, scientific earth measurements. Why would you redact anything concerning the true scientific facts of the earth? I wanted you to see that scientific measurements of the earth, June 1948, it was originally in the Russian language, this is the translated thing, date distributed, July 1949, number of pages 19, just so you can see, here's getting into it here. Now, notice it says, the, of the paper says, outer gravitational field and shape of the physical surface of the earth. Um, gives this guy's name, some Russian guy, Center of Science Research, Institute for Geodetics, Aerial Surveying and Cartography, Moscow. Everybody see that? All right. You can go through this entire document if you want to. I'm just pulling out something that I found very interesting in 1948 from Russian scientists that was classified. They stated here that where, where it is not determined to determinable at all of the points of space without the knowledge of the shape of the earth, but since the shape of the earth is not known. I'm not going to read all this because if I read all this today, we'd be here for a long time. In fact, I cut out stuff. I just wanted you to see that a Russian scientific paper that was classified in 1948 states the shape of the earth is not known. Now let me remind you that we are always told, oh, we've known the shape of the earth since 300 BC. How did Russian scientists, and let me just say that Russian scientists are not stupid people. In fact, reading through their documents, they seem to be more honest with themselves than a lot of American scientists. Because the Russians were just trying to figure out any, they were trying to figure out all truth so they could gain any kind of advantage over us militarily. All right? Just wanted you to see that, 1948. Here's another document. We move forward in time a little bit, 1956, 57 time period. Now, now, what happened, uh, let me say, what happened between about 1948 and this time? The development of jet aircraft and the increase in rocket technology. So we were beginning to be able to fly a little higher, a little faster. So you would think, okay, they know, right? So the Russians started this study, I found out, in the 1940s. They were going to study the light within, they said, the firmament, all right? <laughs> <laughs> this is their words, the light. But they were doing a light study because they were trying, again, they were trying to figure out how they could manipulate or use this knowledge against us with optics and all kinds of stuff. So you see this. This is uh, released by a proof of release, uh, 2000, relation between light scattering coefficient for various angles of optical thickness of the atmosphere. Here we go. You can tell when they're older documents. Ref uh, atmospheric refraction errors for optical instrumentation. <laughs> fun reading, folks, I'm telling you, fun reading. Um, there you have it, tells you technical memorandum, blah, 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 same thing, preliminary report, October 1953. Um, White Sands Proving Ground, La, La Cruces, New Mexico. Here we go, look at this here. Just, just wanted you to see the signatures, real signatures, Dr. Fred Hansen, Dr. J.W. Molner, or whatever, uh, James C. McNatt, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force, Thomas W. Morgan, Major, United States Air Force, Systems and Engineering Branch, uh, Flight Determination Laboratory, White Sands Proving Ground. All here, right? Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, General So-and-so. I guess they're stupid. This one, this document was not to be seen. This document contains information affecting the national defense of the United States within the meaning of the espionage laws, Title 18 U.S.C., Sections 793 and 794, 
It is transmit, uh, its transmission or the revelation of its context in any manner to an unauthorized person is prohibited by law. So this was classified in the 1950s. He's talking about basic equations for atmospheric refraction and all this stuff. He says, here, now I want to point this out. Present equations hold for any altitude. Everybody see that? I don't have time to read all of it. Present equations hold for any altitude. All right, let's see what they're talking about. Table of context, introduction, validity of flat earth assumption for atmospheric calculations. Validity. You know what validity means? Something that is a solid fact. Let me, let me, let me back up. Remember, present equations hold for any altitude. So some of this, this, this study of, of basic atmospheric equations, this is for any altitude. And this is the introduction. This, this is the table of context. Introduction, the validity of flat earth assumption for atmospheric calculations. If it wasn't flat, if the earth was not flat, why would you start off a classified under threat of law in the Espionage Act? Why would you classify that? It's all here, folks. Introduction here says, a comprehensive study of atmospheric refraction errors for optical instrumentation. What is it based on? Based on a flat earth assumption will be published subsequently. The relative mass of the atmosphere at any ele elevation angle is given approximately by the uh, cosent uh, of the elevation angle. I may be pronouncing some of this wrong. But listen, this relationship is correct for a flat earth and a flat atmosphere. This relationship is correct for a flat earth or, and a flat atmosphere. And they're going to publish these results. So we just saw one document say, this is the correct underlying physics, flat non-rotating earth. We see this document right here say, this is correct for any altitude. I tell you, I'm blown, I've, I've been studying this and I'm blown away, just going back through it. I just want validity of flat earth assumption. Validity. They're not saying, okay, see what some of them, this is what some of them say, that the flat earth assumption is just to simplify things. But what this is saying is, is this so-called flat earth assumption is valid. <clears throat> it's valid. Do you see it? Zoom in on it a little bit just so you see it. Validity of flat earth assumption. <laughs> just so you know, the definition of validity. The quality of being logically or factually sound. Right? Look at that. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a good point there, Nathan. He said the second part of the definition, the state of being legally or officially binding or acceptable, that this would stand up in court. And that's why on NASA's website, they only use the word image because legally they're bound. Otherwise, they would be sued. Uh, let's keep going here. Assumption. And anyway, anyway, let's just say that they didn't put in the validity. They just used the word flat earth assumption. You, you hear that a lot. Well, the assumption, a thing that is accepted is true or is certain to happen without proof. I mean, we don't even need proof of this anymore. This is the, what is assumed to be true by the scientific community, by the governments of the world. Everybody see this? Let me ask you something. Are, are you blown away? I mean, it's been a while since I've even read a scripture. You know why? Because these guys have their own flat earth Bible, don't they? It's called their technical manuals. It's mind blowing. Here's more of it here. 
calculation of light dispersion, higher orders. Um, geo, this is USR, geophysics, light dispersion. This is the study um, they were doing. Proof presented light dispersion, higher orders can be computed from data obtained in plain direct observation for USSR references. And this is the institution, the Academy of Sciences, USSR Astrophysical Institute. I mean, again, we're not fooling around here with dummies, right? And this paper, they go on, and again, they go on to tell you the study of the dispersion of light in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, degree, doctoral, physics, math, science, astro and so they just tell you the whole thing here. Joint Council, March 1957, Academy of Science, USSR. Um, again, a lot of this I just pulled out just so you would see that these documents are real and what they were about. But let's get to the interesting stuff. Here's, here's all these PhDs and scientists that are involved in this study at this time. Tells you a little more of the introduction, the table of contents. In, the, in investigation of light scattering in the Earth's atmosphere, formula for the brightness of the blue sky with consideration of first order scattering and all that, you know, blah, blah, blah. All right. And talk, it talks about this first semester, 1957, dissertation, blah, 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 goes through that. Let's get to the interesting meat of this here. Tells you the instruments to use. So right here, it said the observations were carried out in 12 locations at various altitudes above the sea, various climate, meteorological, synoptic conditions. The observations were carried out mainly during high transparency of the atmosphere and the visual range of the spectrum in the absence of snow cover, in the investigations, two instruments designed by V.G. Feskinov or whatever were used. One of these was a visual photometer of the daytime sky intended for measuring the brightness of the firmament. Now what's very interesting about that is Daniel <coughs> chapter 12 verse 4 talks about the righteous shining as the brightness of the firmament. The Bible also talks, 12.3, I'm sorry. The Bible also talks about what? That there are four lights. Talks about the sun, the moon, the stars, and the light um, that's in the world. We'll, we'll deal with that another time. But, but they were wanting to study this, and they said also the other uh, photoelectric halo photometer for determining the brightness from near sun halo. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pause. Time out. Time out. How is something that's supposed to be 93 million miles away, could anything about it be called near? near? <laughs> the near sun. Okay? But it gets better. He says that to, uh, to study the near sun halo and also the sun on the surface perpendicular to these rays. The dissertation contains a certain formula of the brightness of the sky, taking into consideration only the brightness of the first order derived on the assumption of a flat earth and giving some conclusions. Because remember, they're trying to study how light is operating within the atmosphere with a near sun halo, and they tell you over flat earth. This is a Russian document, 1957. It was classified. This is a uh, secret eyes only, Central Intelligence a Agency declassified 2006, January 16th, 1958. Um, this was uh, a memorandum for the record. This was a meeting. Um, they were talking about things going on in Russia. Um, they were talking about this right here. I found it interesting, the minutes of the meeting. They're talking about putting Psalm 19 verse 1 on the vanguard uh, rockets, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I find it interesting that we're talking about this, but at the end of this document, I found a very interesting thing here. And you see that, there's that verse, Psalm 19, that is very clear geocentric. Somebody else had that Psalm 19.1 on their tombstone. Yes, Warner von Braun, uh, the firmament, talking about the firmament. They knew it existed. But this document, as we'll get to it here in a second, let's see here, makes this statement 
at the end. The shape of the firmament, do you see that? Whoa, 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 whoa. hold up now. I think only certain solid things have shape, right? The shape of the firmament. Does everybody see that? You see that? What is a classified document? Classified by the United States government talking about the shape of the firmament. I can tell them what the shape of it is. Right? But they're talking about this. How does, how does an atmosphere, invisible vapor, how does it have a shape? I mean, you know, when the, when the vapor gas, you know, I'm boiling water, my wife's making tea, and it's, I don't see any shape to the vapor. But they're talking about, we've got to figure out the shape of the firmament. Just like one of the Russian documents talked about, they were measuring the brightness of the firmament. They use that term, the brightness of the firmament over a flat earth. The Russians were talking about this back then. All right. Uh, according to what the Bible teaches about the firmament, God said he created a firmament. Well, we're going to read that in Genesis in a minute. And that he separated what was below the firmament from waters that were above it. So it is the firmament that creates what we have, the atmosphere where we breathe and the birds fly and all that stuff. But there is a solid atmosphere. They try to tell us it's a vapor. But the Bible is very different. The Bible says it is a solid, molten dome that was beaten out by God like metal. It was formed like metal. So here's somebody with a hammer beating, using metal and beating it into a dome shape. The, if you look up the word firmament in your lexicons, this is what you see. It talks about it being an extended surface, a solid expanse. Now, this is where like people like Dr. Danny Faulkner answers in Genesis. They just say, oh, the firmament just means the expanse. No, you're just, you're just picking part of the definition. The firmament created the expanse in which we live and breathe and the birds fly. But you had to have something there to support and separate the waters that were from above that are above the firmament, which is what God talked about. So they have a problem because the Bible talks about waters being above the firmament and also the Bible talks about the water still being there. And I've covered this. But he goes on to say, uh, uh, down here, it says the vault of heaven or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid supporting the waters above it. Now this is, this is Bible. This is Bible definitions. These are not metaphors. Um, here's the Wikipedia article on biblical cosmology. He says here very clear uh, in the Old Testament, the word Shamaim uh, represented the sky or atmosphere and also the dwelling place of, of God. The Rakia, see it's a different word. We have the word for sky, Shamaim, and the word Rakia for firmament. Two different words and the word Rakia means that solid dome. It says... Uh, the rocky or firmament, the visible sky, was a solid inverted bowl over the earth, colored blue from the heavenly ocean above it. Rain, snow, and wind, and hell were kept in storehouses outside the rocky, which had windows to allow them in. The waters of Noah's flood entered uh, when the windows of heaven were opened. Heaven extended down uh, and touched at the farthest edges or ends of the earth, which we believe, of course, is what's called Antarctica because it is the ring that goes all the way around. And so on and so forth. So you see that. So the picture, of course, of, of biblical cosmology right there, that we have the flat earth yet with contour. We have the firmament dome. We have the waters above. We have hell, the earth, Sheol, hell, the underworld, both paradise and, and the place of torment is there. And then there's the waters of the great deep. And then God sits, I believe, on the firmament, actually. I think the waters probably come about there. And there's a, the, you know, so, and again, we, it, it's a massive area. And the Bible talks about this. The Bible talks about God sitting his throne upon the firmament. So when they say we go into outer space, you know, one of the things when the, one of the Russian, when the first Russian cosmonauts went up and claimed, claimed to go in, into space, out of the atmosphere, he said, I see no God up here. That was the entire agenda. 
Because immediately, anybody who knew the Bible back then, anybody who knew the Bible, God sits above, right above our atmosphere, on his throne, that is heaven. So if you say, if you claim, I took a spaceship, a rocket up there, and I, I went outside the firmament, and I see no God, you see where they're going with this? And that has been the agenda the whole time. And also, of course, to, you know, milk billions and billions of dollars out of us for space exploration. Um, here's the firmament. The etymology, stereoma, means firmness, solid. That's the way it was translated. The Greek word when it was translated into... Uh, when the Hebrew scriptures in 250 B.C. were translated from Hebrew to Greek, which is called the Septuagint version, the Hebrew scholars that Ptolemy Philadelphus II commissioned because he wanted a Greek version of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures in the Library of Alexandria. When uh, he did that, when they translated the Greek word firmament, they translated this word stereos, or st stereoma, which means firm, solid. Okay? Um, there's no way around that this is what the Hebrews believed and taught. Of course, here's the, the scripture from Genesis. And I said 1 through 10, but it's really, I cut it out so we could get it all on this slide. This is just verses 6 through 8. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. It was so, and God called the firmament heaven. Now remember, the Bible talks about three heavens. And I've shared this before, but again, we have new listeners all the time. So the first heaven is our atmosphere, the expanse created by when God made the firmament known, separated the waters from the water. But he also called that solid firmament heaven. And then he says, Paul talked about being caught up to the third heaven where the throne of God is. All right, so it's real simple. So when the Bible talks about heaven will be shaken, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and heaven itself will be dissolved. He's not talking about the third heaven where God is. He's talking about the sky is going to collapse. It's going to crack. It's going to open. It's going to, some of it's going to collapse. God's going to open it up at the second coming of Jesus. So even, even second coming verses talk about there being a solid sky and it being opened up with great force in the end when Jesus comes. And it says when it's open, it's going to reveal him seated upon his throne. And every eye will see the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon his throne. And they will say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the wrath that is to come. The day is coming, the sky will fall. It will open up. And Jesus will reveal himself to this wicked, unbelieving world. All right? Because Job 37, 18, this is another verse where we get... What it is, it says, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Now, why molten looking glass? Listen, glass is formed by great heat. And there's also glass that has metal in it, lead. Okay? Anybody heard of lead crystal? So, this firmament. Right here, the Bible clearly states, is like molten looking glass. It was, it was formed by God's fire, and he beat it out, and it cooled, and it was solid. But it's also semi-transparent. It's a window. Let's keep going here. As I said a minute ago, proof that the Hebrews believe this. Again, I'm recovering some ground from earlier messages, but this is very important because... Uh, Mr. Danny Faulkner, again, answers in Genesis, claim that there's no evidence of this belief. Well, here's the evidence. Josephus, the most, one of the most respected first century historians, Jewish historian, not a Christian, and this is plainly what he says here. Um, he lived from 37 A.D. past 100 A.D. in book 1, chapter 1, entitled The Constitution of the World and the Disposition of the of the elements Josephus wrote after this on the second day he God placed heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts and he determined that it should stand by itself 
He also placed a crystalline firmament round it and put together in manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and affording the advantages of dews. And on the fourth day he got adorned the heaven with the sun, moon, and, and uh, the other stars and appointed them their courses. <laughs> All right. This is clearly Josephus. And Josephus was, as I've looked into him, he was probably a Pharisee, but at least he agreed with the Pharisees. So what I'm talking about is the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel 2,000 years ago in the first century believed that the firmament was a solid crystalline or crystal glass type structure over the earth. Now this is what they believe. This is irrefutable. I'm sorry. You can try to reduce it to metaphors. You can try to do all these things, but I'm sorry. This is, this is the way it is. All right. I'll just to look up the word crystal here so you understand. He said crystalline firmament. Crystal, quartz that is transparent or nearly so. Uh, that's either colorless or slightly tinged. Something resembling crystal and transparency and colorlessness, a body that is formed by solidification of a chemical element and compound or mixture and has regularly repeating in internal arrangement of its atoms, often external planes, a clear colorless glass of superior quality, so on. So you see crystal is something that is solid. It's glass-like. So, so it's interesting too, as you see, that Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel talked about the firmament and called it, and I'm not going to read all this, he said, the likeness of the firmament upon or over their heads of the living creatures was as the color, and if you look that up in the word Hebrew, it's the, the appearance of the terrible crystal. Now that's what your Bible says, right? There is reference after reference after reference of the firmament dome that is supporting the waters above being solid, iron-like glass. Okay? I'm just showing you. You can read all this. You go back to Ezekiel 1. Now here's Revelation. We have the book of Revelation. John was on the Isle of Patmos, exiled for the word of God. He was being persecuted by the Roman emperor at the time. So he says hey, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He saw a door open in heaven. Let's look at this. He said, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, the trumpet talking with me and said, come up here, and I will show you things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around the throne, the sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were the four and twenty seats, and the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in, in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Everybody see that? So the throne of God, Ezekiel said the throne of God sits on the firmament that is like terrible crystal. Here we see in heaven, as he's depicting the throne, he says it is seated there in front of the throne is this sea of glass that is like unto crystal. I'm not making this up. This is what your Bible says. You've got to deal with this, right? doesn't say that above the dome, above the atmosphere, is this empty void of space that goes on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of billions of light years. The Bible does not teach that. It tells you that the throne of God is just right there, seated upon the glass firmament. That is what your Bible teaches. Um, this is the book of Revelation 4. We see it again in Revelation 15. So I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark that coming chip and the antichrist system and the new world order those that overcome that and end up in heaven he says i see over the number of his name he says they stand on the sea of glass do you everybody see that with harps in their hands singing giving praise to god so he's saying those that overcome this antichrist satanic system that find Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that accept the Lamb of God who was slain to take away the sins of the world, will stand on the sea of glass. We will stand on it one day. 
God's going to leave part of it. We're going to stand on it one day. Because the throne is there. God calls the firmament a demonstration of his power. And these boys right here can't get through it. And they know they can't. All right? <laughs> now, uh, of course, Revelation 6, 12. Let me go ahead and read this because this is why well, I mentioned it a minute ago. But this is at the sixth seal. This is, this is also spelled out in, in Matthew 24 when Jesus was talking about the signs of his coming and the end of the age. And he says, I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth. How does that happen in a heliocentric model? Right? They tell us they're big as massive suns, right? Yeah, whatever. All right, I believe God. Not Neil, not Neil deGrasse Tyson. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island removed out of its places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? So God's going to roll back part of the firmament. And people say, well, what about the water up there? Well, do you remember a couple of events like the Red Sea and the Jordan? God parted the waters. I believe that was a picture, too, of his second coming. He's going to, he's going to part the firmament and he's going to part the waters that are there. And, he's going to, and, he's, and actually, a lot of people think he's coming just like, no, he's going to sit there and let them, let them see him for a few minutes. It's like, like pulling back a curtain. He's just going to sit on his throne. And they're all going to see. Now, all, of, all, all the earth seeing that happen can't happen on a sphere. The poor Australians would never get to see this, right? And then somebody said, oh, it'll be on TV. Really? Do you think with every mountain moving and ma the massive earthquakes that caused the mountains to fall and every island to move, do you think TV's going to be working? No. Ridiculous. So, here you have it. The Bible's very accurate about the nature. It's very clear about the nature of the molten glass sky dome. Right? It's the curtain that's going to reveal the throne of God when he removes it. So let's, let's go to these scriptures here. This is for the Christians out there to say, no, the, the, they have the vapor canopy theory of the atmosphere, that it all condensed and collapsed, and that was the flood of Noah, and it's no more there. And so we got this empty vacuum, and I don't even know how you'd have a, you know, the vacuum of space up against a vapor atmosphere, and it would stay. I guess everything's the magic word is gravity, right? <laughs> Gravity's holding the air, right? So the space can't suck it away, but yet the sun's supposed to be pulling and holding on to us, so why does the sun's gravity pull, suck the atmosphere away? I don't know. It's all a mystery. But the Bible says that there's still waters above, waters above the firmament. Now, the flood happened in 2500 B.C. Windows of heaven were open. Uh, the windows of heaven, it said, you know, came, the water came from three places. It came from the clouds, it came from the heaven, it came from the great deep. Okay? So God opened the windows of heaven, water came down, clouds rain, and water, he broke up the great deep, and it came up. That was the flood of Noah. So here you have, though, the Holy Spirit spoke through King David, who was a king, anointed, also a prophet. Also God moved upon him to write the scriptures. And you see these words here. He says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heaven. 1,500 years after the flood, the Holy Spirit inspires David to talk about the waters that are above the heaven still. So if there's waters above the heaven, and NASA's telling us that they went into space, they went outside of our atmosphere, beyond. Wait a minute. Wouldn't they need a submarine to do that? According to the Bible, it would have to be a submarine. They would have to be in water. Maybe that's why they train in a pool. Maybe they're thinking they're going to get through it. All right. But I want you to see this. He talks about here Psalm 18. He, speaking of God, made 
dark waters, his secret place, his pavilion round about him with the dark waters. Here's a little illustration I made. There's, there you go. Everybody get a, get a, just a little grasp. I just kind of threw something, even, even threw you a little aurora in there the, the, from the throne there, right? And of course, this verse here, Isaiah 40, 22, it is he, God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof as, as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So God, basically the firmament was the tent. It's the canopy. And he sits upon it. And as we've stated many times before, the word circle here is not sphere. In the Hebrew, it is the word um, kug, which means circle, not sphere. There is a word in Hebrew called dur, which is ball. Did not use the word for ball here. It used the word for circle. So what he's saying is that this dome is a circle that goes around. And I don't have time to get into it, but I can even show you where the Hebrew letters bear this out, that the dome is the high fence that creates God, God made us a place to live it's not spinning orbiting hurling through space we're not the speck of the dust like what was his name the famous guy why well, can't I remember we're not the speck of dust in the galaxy Sagan yeah but this is this confirms Ezekiel talking about the throne set on the firmament that says he sits on the circle of the earth the Bible is consistent saying the same thing. This is not a metaphor. This is real. All right. Now let's keep going. Y'all gonna love this. This is who? Wh wh what's the website? Everybody, look at top there. All right. NASA.gov. Uh, April 1961. National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Calculation of wind compensation for launching unguided rockets. Pretty serious stuff. Rocket science. <laughs> Rocket science. Calculating wind. All right. Pretty important thing to know when you're shooting rockets. Faith and I discovered that not too long ago. We shot up uh, one of our rockets and the wind took it far, far away. We never found it. <laughs> All right, so this is an important little tidbit of thing to study, you know, if you're going to send them up high, right? So I did the little wind effect. Did you like that? Oh, let me back it up for you. Look at the See? The wind effect. There we go. <laughs> Have a little fun. There it is again, just so you see it up close. Calculation of wind compensation for launching unguided rockets. So we're talking about rocket, rockets by Robert L. James Jr. and Ronald J. Harris, Langley Research Center, Langley, Virginia, Langley Field. I would say pretty important stuff, right? All right. But who reads this stuff? Who stays up all night and all day reading this stuff? I do. <laughs> all right. Technical note. Here we go. Summary, method for calculating wind compensation for unguided missiles. It is derived from which has a greater degree of flexibility than previously proposed methods, blah, 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 and they get into it. So they're telling you, summary, here's what we're up to, trying to figure out how to guide rockets. Yes, sir. Linear aerodynamics. Linear aerodynamics, yes. Coefficients with respect to flow, incidence angles are used, launch angles for wind compensation. I mean, it's pretty serious stuff, right? I think you'd probably need to get it right. I know if I was their general or their boss, I'd say you, you guys better get it right. This stuff's expensive, so let's get it right. It better work. All right, <laughs> it better work. Let's look at this. It says trajectory simulation incorporating the above requirements is presented in reference eight. In addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom and aerodynamic symmetry and roll and the missile position. Again, space will deal with that. They don't even, it's not what they're talking about. They're, they're, what we think, what they've told us, and what they know space is, two different things. So when they say it, they don't mean what, what they've lied about. The missile position in space is computed relative to a flat, non-rotating Earth. April 1961, NASA technical document for calculating unguided missiles. Not anything we're sending into space. Just unguided missiles, like the V-2 was an unguided missile. Let's keep going here. Here's another one. Okay, completely different document. Where did it come from? NASA.gov, right? Unpublished preliminary data, atmospheric oscillations, tells you the people. Georgia Tech Project. Georgia Tech, here we go, all right? 
my wife's brother is a professor at Georgia Tech. He would be losing his mind if he heard this, but his own university has been part of this. Under contract, Georgia Tech project contract, prepared National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So this was in conjunction with their engineers, engineering experiment station, Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, blah, 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 the requirements for additional copies. Um, talks about that, says the Department of Defense contractors must be established for DDC services or have their need to know certified by the cognizant military agency. So this was not to be passed around. This was need to know. All right. Georgia Tech Project, just so you see it. Boom, boom, April 1965. Tells you the abstract, develop present theories of atmospheric oscillations. Blah, blah, blah. I don't have to. All right. A model frequently used is that of, everybody say it, flat and rotating earth. The most uh, one can profitably simplify the problem is to consider the isothermal atmosphere, plane level surfaces, and a non-rotating earth. They say flat earth more than we do. They say flat earth more than we do. <laughs> now, now remember, we, I, I have shown you documents here. And again, there's, there's so much more. I'm, I mean, I'm having to trim this down. We're already at 1215, all right? So I'm trying to get through this. And there's just so much here. But I just wanted you to see. We're talking about 1948, 1957, 1960s, 1970. Here, everybody see this? NASA technical memorandum. Where did it come from? NASA.gov, right? Declassified. Freedom of Information Act tells you all about it. Determination of angles of attack and side slip from radar data and the role stabilized platform. Hmm. R Langley Research Center. What's in Langley? CIA. Virginia. Yeah, CIA headquarters. Exactly. Also, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Washington, D.C. Wait a minute. I thought they were in Florida and Houston, Texas. Oh, oh, that's right. I'm sure they have an office. All right. Let's keep going here. Here's the abstract. Uh, NASA Langley Research Center, technical memorandum, blah, blah, blah. Here is in the abstract. Basically what they're describing this manual is all about. This is a summary of it. Here's what they say. Equations for angles of attack and side slip relative to both rolling and non-rolling body axis system are derived for a flight vehicle for which radar and gyroscope attitude data are available. The method is limited, however, to application where a flat, non-rotating Earth may be assumed. The application for this whole thing is, has to be based on a flat, non-rotating earth. Wait a minute, how many documents are we into here? I'm going to read that again. Equations for angles, angles of attack, side slip relative to both rolling and non-rolling body axis system are derived for a flight vehicle. So we're talking about stuff that flies and for which radar and gyroscope attitude data are available. The method is limited, however, to application where a flat, non-rotating Earth may be seen. To say that the method is limited to a flat, non-rotating Earth means it does not work for a spherical Earth. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Let's keep going. Ah, oh, here we have something else. Oh, is that the same one? I got the same. Oh, it's the same manual. <laughs> so let me, oh, I think. Yeah, here we go. Let's keep going here. Ah, yes. This is interesting because he talks about, he gives you this little frame reference. Look at north, south, east, west, right? And they're telling you that, uh, again, that represents the earth, the earth fixed axis system. Everybody see that? Right, right there. The radar provides range, azimuth, and elevation data from uh, radar site to the vehicle throughout flight. So we're talking about stuff happening throughout flight, right? Uh, the data in conjunction with wind data can be easily converted to pitch, blah, 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 flight path angles. It is assumed herein that the Earth is represented as a flat and non-rotating reference frame. Why would it be assumed that the Earth is represented as a flat, non-rotating 
reference fl uh, frame. Exactly. I I'm going to tell you, I'm blown away, but let's, 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 this earth fixed system is, is interesting here. Why, why do I say earth fixed? Isn't it supposed to be spinning, tilted, orbiting, flying through the universe? Yet the stars never change in the sky, right? In the night sky. But yet we're spinning, flying, orbiting. Millions of miles. Been doing it for thousands of years. Nothing in the night sky ever changes. They know. Come on, they know. It is assumed herein that the earth is represented as a flat, non-rotating reference frame. Yet they're going to tell us snipers have to adjust for shooting a thousand yard shot. That takes about two seconds. Maybe less than that. But you don't have to calculate the earth's spin for an aircraft for a helicopter, a drone, a drone. Right. the space shuttle. I'll show you that in a minute too. I brought the drone too. Let's keep going. Here it is. Notice it says, uh, also by definition, the X and Z plane will be vertical, perpendicular to the horizontal plane of the earth at all times. <laughs> the horizontal plane of the earth at all times. The breadth of the earth, exactly. That plateau thing, that spread out, wide, flat thing. Oh, I can have fun. I can keep going. Now, why, why, why do they say earth fixed system? Well, it's interesting. Here's a few verses, right? The earth is not spinning. According to the Bible, Chronicles 16.30, he has fixed the earth firm and immovable. Psalm 93.1, thou hast fixed the earth immovable and firm. Psalm 96.10, he has fixed the earth firm and immovable. Psalm 105, thou didst fix the earth on its foundation so that it, it never can be shaken. Who made the earth and fashioned it himself, fixed it fast. And of course, my, one of my favorites that I didn't put on here, Zechariah 1.11, that says the earth is still and it rests. Um, earth fixed system. They're telling you, non-rotating, earth fixed. The word fixed means it's not, it's not moving, it's not going anywhere. Of course, this was proven by these two scientists. In physics, Michelson and Morley, they proved this a long time ago. These two scientists conducted numerous experiments to measure the orbital velocity of the Earth through the ether uh, with light beams. I'm going to talk about the ether. The ether is real. And these, these d documents uh, I found prove they believe it's real. And we're going to get into that next week. But uh, and many, actually, in fact, many present theoretical physicists believe the ether is real now. It, it, it was taboo subject for a long time, but not anymore. And um, this threw the godless and anti-Bible scientific. Of course, I said their experiments showed that the earth was not moving at all. Now, they expected. These guys believed the model, the lie, the Copernican model. They believed they were going to measure how fast the earth was moving. Their experiment showed it wasn't moving. And they were like, well, what's going on? And they repeated these experiments over and over and over again and came up with the same results, true science. The earth's not moving. So Einstein comes up with a theory to debunk this, to get rid of the ether so he can debunk their experiment. And of course, we know what Tesla said about the theory of relativity, that it was foolishness, basically. Oh, uh, what's this one? This is a uh, NASA technical memorandum, nasa.gov, mathematical model of a CH-53 helicopter. You guys know a helicopter pilot. All right, so here's the NASA manual on that. Uh, Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, California. Um, equations of motion. The helicopter equations of motion are given in body axes with respect to a flat, non-rotating Earth. Meaning the helicopter takes off, it doesn't have to worry about the Earth spinning below it. You can't stay in one spot and wait on time. That's right. <laughs> Can't stay in one spot and wait on China. I love it. Exactly. Now, I'm going to go back to one. This is the first government document. I shared this at the Flat Earth International Conference in Raleigh in uh, my presentation, 2017, November, last November, that Robbie Davidson put on. Um, I thought this was something to find this document. All right? <laughs> this is how little did I know. This was the tip of the iceberg. But this is a NASA technical manual. 
You can look it up. Anybody out there watching and listening this morning, you can Google NASA document 1207. You can pull up. It'll take you straight to nasa.gov. You can pull up the PDF. You can read this for yourself. This is free information. Okay. So Stephen Anderson, Danny Faulkner, Pastor Lawson, Ken Hovine. This is what NASA said. And I'm going to show you, they say far worse than what's in this document today. Right? But here's what they say. The derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model. In the introduction, they flat out say right here, the rep this report documents the derivation, which means the origin, and the definition of linear aircraft model for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Everybody see that? Derivation means the origin. Definition means this is, this is how it's defined. This is how it works. So they're talking about the equations. And they, I mean, you want to talk about the calculus and trig this thing gets into. The equations are based on these airplanes flying over a non-rotating flat earth. Question, why would this be in any technical manual of anybody if it doesn't exist? I mean, think about it. They claim the Coriolis effect that, that snipers have to, to uh, calculate the, the spinning of the earth, the Coriolis effect, when they're shooting a, you know, a thousand yard shot or something. Yet, they don't have to for Mach 1, 2, 3, 4 aircraft. You don't have to calculate the spin. No, no, no. This is just about we, the, these planes fly over non-rotating flat earth. So, oh, well, Pastor Dean, this is what I heard. Oh, well, that, they're just doing that to simplify the equations. Oh, oh, really? I'm sorry. I didn't know that NASA rocket scientists and MIT mathematicians couldn't factor in eight inches per mile squared. I'm sorry. They have to simplify the math. I'm, maybe they missed a class at MIT or something. I don't know. But this is, this is crazy. Now, you can try to dismiss this if you want to, but it's also uh, in the conclusion, the concluding remarks of the report and all the math in the equations. Look at that. This report derives and defines a set linearized system matrices for rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. I didn't write that. It seems that someone at NASA is a flat earther. Oh, my God. Right? How can this be? Now, they have to design stuff for it to work the way things are. That's one. Let's keep going here. There's your definition of derivation, obtaining or developing something from a source of origin. Why, why, why would you develop the equations for aircraft to fly <laughs> over something that doesn't exist. Oh, let's factor in the unicorn <laughs> equation <laughs> just in case the Pegasus, the flying horse equation. So, yeah. Now, they're telling you it exists. Definition, of course, is a statement of the exact meaning of something. Here's some of my detractors. Uh, they talk about. Uh, the said documents quoted uh, are quote mined and cherry picked by fraudulent and deceptive flatheads. One example, NASA official document 1207 admits flat earth. Uh, the sad fact is that they don't bother or are too ignorant to read and understand. Um, and what's interesting about this, and, I, and of course he goes, these models are widely used not only for computer applications, but also for quick approximations and desk calculations leaving out earth curvature and rotation for simplification. So again, I, I covered that. They're going to claim that it's to simplify their math and equations and their work. So they do it real quick on the desk. But, I, you know, I looked up approximation, and, you know, and approximation means not really correct, right? Um, so anyway, they write a lot of stuff that's not really correct. But I wanted to address the issue of cherry picking, of course, the same thing said here pretty much 
And, and let's just deal with this. I, I actually had put this on Facebook because it really illustrates the point. Well, here we have an orange tree with cherries on it. <laughs> okay. First of all, that doesn't exist in nature unless it's some kind of, you know, genetic manipulated thing in a, in a lab somewhere. But this doesn't really exist. I said, some people have accused me of cherry picking through the government documents that state their equations are based on a flat, non-rotating earth. But should there be any flat earth cherries to pick on a globe earth orange tree? Should there at all? But they tell me that the cherries are on the orange tree to simplify the orange tree math. Thus, I should ignore the cherries. I just wanted to illustrate that, of course. And there's your globe earth tree with... Flat Earth cherries on it to pick, okay? And uh, really, if, if, it's, if it's not flat, why address that? And some of them tried to say, well, okay, it was because of just for short distances. Well, I don't see the shuttle landing over short distances. Even the true thing it's used for, which I'm going to address this morning. I don't see... Mach 1, 2, 3, and Mach 4 aircraft like the SR-71, I don't see it being short distances that it covers in very, very short amount of time. All right? Um, so what I'm getting at is that excuse really falls flat. And as I said last week, and I'm going to stand firm on this, the reason that so many different government documents, technical manuals, MIT, Different universities, Georgia Tech, we address, use these flat earth equations is because it is flat. All right? And they know it, and they've known it for a long time, and they have to design things to work as uh, reality is. Okay? Let's think about that. Here we go. All right? Uh, here's another one I wanted to address, this one right here, because I found something absolutely funny. This uh, guy said, why did you lie about the Russian Earth Measurements document? It clearly <laughs> states several times that the Earth is a geoid, okay? Which this was the funniest thing because if you, if you go to the document, and I'm going to show you in a minute, but if you go to the document and you keep reading, and you've got to remember, I couldn't go through documents that had 10, 20, 100 pages, 200 pages, 1,100. I couldn't do that last week or we would have been here you know, for several days. Um, but so he's talked about, well, they clearly said the earth is a geoid, right? Now, here's what's funny. Do you see this website here? The National Geodetic Survey, dot gov. Everybody see that? I, I'm like, I don't know what a geoid is. I, I was assuming that geoid meant, well, we don't know, really know, but we, we, we still believe the earth is maybe a lumpy sphere. Right? A lumpy sphere. Or maybe like Neil deGrasse Tyson says, it's pear-shaped. Right? Or an oblate spheroid. Yet all the pictures we get from NASA from space, it's perfectly spherical. Yet they tell us it's an oblate spheroid. Then they tell us it's, uh, you know, they tell us it's pear-shaped. Then they tell us it's a geoid. Or, and then as the Russian document's going to say, well, we don't know if it's a geoid, an ellipsoid, or a quasi-geoid. All right, quasi-geoid. So I went to the United States government National Geodetic Survey to get a definition. What is a geoid? If this is what the Russians were saying the shape was, and really, as I stated in the Russian document, they stated they, the shape of the earth is unknown, is what they said, right? And, which is mind-boggling itself. So here's the definition from their site. I don't know if you can see it, NGS, NOAA.gov up there at the top. And I'm going to try to read this. But here's what it says. It says, um, there have been many definitions of a geoid over 150 years or so. Here is the one currently adopted by the National Geodetic Survey. Right? Geoid, the uh, equipotential surface of the Earth's gravity field, which best fits in a least square sense global mean sea level. Okay. Then they say this. Even though we adopt a definition, that does not mean we are perfect in the realization of that definition. For example, altimetry uh, is often used to define mean sea level in the oceans, but altimetry uh, uh, is not global, missing the near polar regions. As fit, the between global mean sea level and the geoid is not entirely confirmable. 
Does this sound like they have a clear definition of what a geoid is? Okay. So, the Russians stating in classified documents, or what used to be classified documents, in their Earth measurements, 1948, declassified, as you can see, is from the CIA, Intentional Central Intelligence Agency. These documents uh, were classified, listing Lois. He says, geoid, this is where I talked about last week. It says, um, they're, they're, <laughs> they're saying it's not determinable at all points of space without knowledge of the shape of the Earth. But since the shape of the Earth is not known, they tell you that. And then, of course, I get into some of this. The system now adopted for reduction to a geoid and to an ellipsoid from a geoid is inadequate. I mean, again, they're sitting here going, we don't know. Now, let me say this. Even people who believe in the biblical cosmology, the flat enclosed system, we do believe that the Earth is some type of geometric shape. We just don't know. But we know that the surface in which we live on is flat with contour. All right? That's what we observe. That's what we can test. Like our test, 13, 14 miles across Mobile Bay proved that there's absolutely no curvature whatsoever uh, when you do the math. And uh, we had engineers with us. We had a geometry teacher with us. I mean, th these are not dumb people, all right? And these tests are being done all over the world. And you can see they go on to talk about it, the geoid. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it says for the sake of uh, defi definiteness, I guess, <laughs> definiteness, we are obliged to introduce a new term for the surface in question. Let us agree to call it a quasi-geoid. On the ocean plane, the quasi-geoid uh, coincides with a geoid, but on the continents, the quasi-geoid can be taken, if necessary, as an appropriate expression of the geoid shape. I mean, uh, anybody understand what they're talking about? No. Okay. I don't think they do either. Now, let's get <laughs> into this. I just wanted to address the question. Uh, when the National Geodetic Survey says we don't really, we can't really define a geoid, I think that says enough, right? But I will hear, no, it means a sphere, really? Okay, or it means an, you know, an oval, or it means a pear. Um, so, okay, you guys need to make up your mind because the pictures we get, the alleged pictures, which are composite images, from NASA says, it's always perfect circle, always. So, I'm just saying, somebody's confused. We know that the so-called space program and most of the governments of the world, but let's just deal with NASA real quick, that they, it was founded and filled with Nazis from Nazi Germany, scientists like Werner von Braun that we brought over here, scrubbed their evil doings in the Hitler's SS, put them in charge of all kinds of things in our government. But most of your astronauts were openly Freemasons. Um, you see there's the ring on Buzz Aldrin. There's Buzz doing the 666, one eye, Illuminati symbolism. Uh, here's the medallion for the moon landing. It's a Freemason medallion. I mean, it's just one of the... Hear them worshiping the triangle, uh, you know, with their, with their Masonic aprons on. And they, these, the high-level Masons take blood oaths. They know they're worshiping Lucifer, Albert Pike, and others, Manly P. Hall. Make this very clear. So we're dealing in, in both in the governments of the world, wealthy, uh, a lot of the wealthy people, a lot of the astronauts, a lot of the early rockets. I mean, they're coming out with the, uh, or they just came out with the strange angel about Jack Parsons. And they're just showing that he was deeply into Satanism and the occult and cult rituals. And he was the one of, you know, basically the father of modern rocket, rocketry, you know. Um, of course, they try to diminish the fact that he was really the one that spearheaded it. Because he was an obvious Satanist hang out with Aleister Crowley and so on and so forth. But what blows my mind, and I like this little meme here that my friend Paul Nassalize Thomas did, um, but just pointing it out. Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? 
Are we going to believe God's word? Or are we going to believe Luciferian Freemasons? Think about that. And here was the one that kind of started. This is the title of one of the manuals. Everybody read this with me. Propagation of electromagnetic fields over flat earth. Army manual. February 2001. You can say, oh, well, Pastor D, the 1950s stuff and the 1960s stuff, oh, they just didn't know they've learned stuff since. Right? Nope. They tell you right here. And you go into the manual. Here's the table of context. It says comparison of principal fields from an ideal dipole oriented perpendicular to a horizontal and homogeneous flat earth. Army manual. They tell you right here, it's assumed that the transmitting antenna and target or receiver are located above but near the surface of a flat idealized earth. Over and over again. Army Research Laboratory, uh, this is another one, calculating low atmosphere profiles, sound speed at night. So calculating sound speed, right? Pretty important stuff. Uh, it says, to briefly examine short range acoustic attenuation at night, we use low atmosphere profiles of wind speed, temperature, relative humidity, shown before as input to a flat earth, non-turbulent acoustic propagation model called the Windows Version Scanning Fast Field Program. So, Ted, you're a computer guy. They're talking about running a computer program and using as input to a what? Flat Earth. Non-turbulent non atmosphere. Which, which means, you know what they tell us? That the atmosphere is not moving with the spin of the Earth. It's non-turbulent. I mean, it's not, it's not carrying anything with it. And it's interesting, I haven't had to go to one conspiracy website. <laughs> I haven't been on Infowars.com. Snoops. Snoops. Snopes. I haven't been anywhere, have I? I hadn't been to Above Top Secret. I haven't been to any of those sites. You haven't even had to use the Bible verse. Mm -mm. No? Here's MIT. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the top technical school in the country. Or at least one of the top. I'm sure they argue among themselves who's the top. What's this? dspace.mit.edu. Right? Property-based system design method with application to targeting system for small unmanned vehicles. So this is a targeting system developed Massachusetts Institute of Technology, blah, blah, blah. Tells you who it is, the author of this. And then in the description, it says three targeting methods were, con were considered assuming a flat earth. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why would an MIT professor, PhD, why would he assume the earth is flat? Assuming a flat earth. No, he says, he says three targeting methods. Consider assuming a flat earth using DTED data and using angle uh, range data. The evaluation, oh, 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 I, I hit it myself. The evaluation revealed a descending utility order, flat earth and range based upon the system's requirements. I mean, these are, these, and <laughs> aeronautics and astronautics. Yeah. Flat earth assumption, um, mind blowing. Just wanted you to see MIT and other doctoral candidates and PhDs saying it's flat and it's not moving. That's what the Bible said. It's flat and it's not moving. We can say it, but you say it, you're crazy. I, yeah, if I say it, I'm crazy. But these guys can say it and, and, and their, their papers get passed around among the elite and, and a lot of them classify. Yes, and many of them do have Nobel Prize. And they get, sometimes, sometimes they get classified. Right? And then declassify. Here, here's one. This one is uh, NASA.gov. Now, this is general equations of motion for a damaged asymmetric aircraft. So what they're trying to do is fix equations. If a, if a plane loses part of its wing or tail fin or whatever, 
how to compensate and all that stuff, right? So, so that's what this is about. And the technical manual gives you this stuff. The introduction, here's the introduction, right? Um, just so you know, it says, in order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. Now, I, I want to say that, I want everybody to pay close attention. They're telling you right here in the introduction of this, and they're showing you a damaged aircraft. They're saying, in order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft and dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. It must, what we're gonna do here must reflect the true physics. Must be true reality. Physics. People say, you don't understand physics. Okay, well these people do. <laughs> All right. Who are we talking about here? The American Institute of Aeronautics and astronautics. And here's what they say, rigid body equations of motion, reference to an arbitrary fixed point on the body. There are several approaches that can be used to develop the general equations of motion. The one selected here starts with Newton's laws applied to the collection of particles defining the rigid body. Any number of dynamics or physics books can serve as references. So they're saying the physics books can serve as references. I said in this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat non-rotating earth are developed. Why? <laughs> Why? So you're telling me that the physics of a non-rotating flat earth are the proper physics yep. Yep. in a NASA document. This is not Pastor Dean saying this. These are NASA documents. These are government documents. I, I, does everybody see that? And they're not the same authors. No. No. Authors. Over many years, different schools, the University of Delaware, Georgia Tech, MIT. No, 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 no. Russian <laughs> scientists. Now, here's a doctoral dissertation by a PhD candidate that became part of this European Control Conference. In fact, he, he I guess he graduated, but he... He, his, his, this doctoral dissertation that he began to speak to, I guess, the European Space Agency or whatever, a new path planner based on flatness approach, application to an atmosphere reentry mission. This was designed for the, for the space shuttle, quote, reentry. And, and it's funny, they put orbit and reentry and stuff like that into quotations. And I'll explain all that next week. We'll get into that next week. But uh, notice the outline of his doctoral dissertation statement of uh, guidance problem. Hmm, why would you have a guidance problem? Well, if you're basing stuff on a spherical earth and it's really flat, then you're gonna have a guidance problem, <laughs> right? So this guy comes along and goes, you know what? We gotta get back to a flatness approach. I'm not making this up, Smart. right? Flatness based trajectory planning. Here we go. He's talking about for this little vehicle right here. And we'll keep going. Notice he says model in flat earth coordinates. Everybody see that? Again, this doesn't exist, right? Flat earth doesn't exist, but we're going to have a model for it and all this unicorn math. Sprinkled with fairy dust. So this guy's doing a doctoral dissertation in this present time to help with guidance system of the shuttle. And now we have unmanned shuttle system. But he's doing this and saying, we've had guidance problems, so we've got we to we gotta go to a flatness approach, to a flat earth model. Now, I'm going to tell you, this guy's way smarter than me. I couldn't do this kind of math not even in my dreams, okay? But he does, and he says, guys, we need a flat earth model. And here's the math for it. Shall we keep going? Notice this, assumptions, meaning things we assume are true. Flat earth, Coriolis and centrifugal forces neglected. 
here's a doctoral candidate who graduated, got his PhD, becomes a speaker to the European Control Council, and he's telling them it's a flat earth, we ignore Coriolis, meaning the spin of the earth, it's completely ignored. Why? Because it doesn't exist! And it's what the Bible said all along. The earth is fixed, stable, immovable, still, and at rest. Everything secret is being uncovered. Now, uh, let me show you something. I'm going to make my illustration this morning. I know I've said it a couple times. But I want to use the illustration of a log splitter. <laughs> something us Alabama boys appreciate. I don't have one. If anybody wants to buy me one, you're welcome to. I do it the old-fashioned way with a maul and wedges and sledgehammers. Log splitter would be nice. Um, but log splitters, they're, they're, they're engines and they're generating certain pounds of pressure and there's, there's a lot of science involved in this. True science, right? And so here we have how to calculate the splitting force of a log splitter. I mean, we got this guy, I mean, this guy broke down the calculation, right? So we can figure out the pounds per square inch. I mean, the larger the logs, the more splitting force you will need. I know all about this, right? Measure the diameter. I mean, he goes through, he tells you how to calculate pounds per square inch, the piston, all this stuff, right? For a log splitter. So if you got all this calculation to figure out the PSI of a log splitter, at some point in your calculations, would you say, you know what? I've got to throw in the Thor hammer assumption. I'm going to throw this in for, so it'll be right. So we just assume that we've got the log splitter. Maybe we've got a tough log, but we're going to make sure we have the Thor hammer. No, you would never say that. You would never say that. Why? Because Thor is a mythical individual. His hammer, mythical. It's not true. It's not a fact. It's not, no part of it's a fact. So why would you include that in a log splitter equation when you're trying to explain to somebody how a log splitter works and how the pistons work and how the, you create the, the, the pressure to split the logs? Why would you say, oh, but we've got to throw in the Thor hammer assumption and equations for the Thor hammer in assistance with the log splitter but that's what NASA does. And that's what the, the excuse you will hear. You, you share this message, you share these documents, and you'll start to hear, well, 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 now, now, they don't mean, well, 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 they don't mean what they're saying. So are they in literature school or are they in rocket science school? Metaphors. Metaphors, exactly. Metaphors. Scientific, mathematical metaphors. Oh, payloads for... Uh, spinning projectiles. Army, think you need to know where artillery is going to land? <laughs> Look here. Projectile flight dynamics. A six DOF rigid projectile model is employed to predict the dynamics of a projectile in flight. The assumption of these equations assume a flat earth. These equations. A whole bunch of math we're going to do. BG Karpov experimental observations of dy dynamic behavior of liquid filled shells, U.S. Army Ballistics Research Laboratory, Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, August 1961, is a reference to this. But he says, and again, a projectile. You want to know where that artillery round is going to land. And what this study is, the one that has a solid explosive versus one that has a liquid payload. I'm talking about chemical weapons or biological weapons. So they want to know, figure out the equations. So a six DOF rigid projectile model is employed to predict the dynamics of a projectile in flight. These equations assume a flat earth. Again, why would you do unicorn math? Why would you do Thor hammer math if they don't exist? Why would you try to calculate ballistic missiles, unguided rockets? shuttle landings, why would you base all your equations, all of your science 
on a flat earth, non-rotating, non-moving, stationary atmosphere if it doesn't exist no more than a unicorn or Thor's hammer. This is the Army Research Laboratory. Notice every time when you see dot mill, whenever you see dot mill, the only in the United States, the only people that can have dot mill, military. This is the Army's research, ma uh, research Laboratory. Beacon position and altitude navigation aided by magnetometer. I'm not going to try to pronounce those people's names. You can see the documents prepared by the University of Delaware Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering under contract to the U.S. government. This is, oh, I guess these people are dummies, right? They're stupid, right? This tells you who they are. I'm not going to get into all that, but this tells you the PhDs and the people who were assisting this study. And here we find something. Problem formulation. Coordinate systems. The motion of an object usually described by rigid body equations of motion derived from Newton's laws. This section summarizes and notates three kinds of coordinate systems. The first is the earth fixed coordinate system, which is fixed to the earth with a flat earth assumption. Okay, now remember, we're talking about beacons for aircraft and aircraft flying, moving, and we're talking about stuff that's moving. Why would you assume, first of all, why would you use the term earth fixed? I'll deal with that in a second. And a flat earth assumption. An assumption means something that is just known to be true. It's just assumed because it is known. It gets more interesting because they have a little diagram here of what they're talking about. And this little diagram of the earth seems to look like something. And they tell you that this y-axis and the x-axis are horizontal. Oh, like that. Horizontal. And that this little disc right here is flat. And it even has a nice little dome over it. And fixed points on the dome that they use for Navigation. This is not me. I want to re repeat Army Research Laboratory. Dot Army, dot Mill, not Pastor Dean. Yes, sir. You've seen Isaiah 44 13 before? Say it loud. I'm going to read it to you. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with the planes, or with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass and maketh it after the figure of a man, your face. Oh. Think of the top north, your nose, center. Right. It's the, it's the for most people, center dome. Yep, your absolutely. Nose is the center point, the likeness of a man's face. Mm -hmm. And look, at, look, look, and look, does this not look like something, maybe, maybe we've seen? <gasps> oh, oh, what is that? Let me, let me back up, do you see that? <laughs> but we're the crazy ones. Why is the biblical Hebrew cosmology shape of the earth in a U.S. Army manual? Why? Oh, Pastor Dean, that's just a coincidence. Oh, really? Well, let's keep going. Look at there. They know the truth. Here we go. This is a different one. Everybody see where this uh, came from? NASA.gov. You could interchange CIA.gov, NASA.gov. It's all the same. Okay? They work together. In fact, I believe that all high-level NASA people are spooks is what I believe. All right? Um, here we have the singular arc time optimal climb trajectory of aircraft in a two-dimensional wind field. Oh, Lord. These guys... Right? NASA research, smart people are rocket scientists. Everybody says, I'm not a rocket scientist. Well, these are, right? All right? So this document goes on to say, in our minimum time to climb problem, the aircraft is modeled as a point mass and the flight trajectory is strictly confined in a vertical plane on a non-rotating flat Earth. Do you see that? Does everybody see that? And then they've got this nice little equation here. 
Thus, the pertinent equations of motion for the problem are defined in its, uh, in its the state variable form as, and then they give you the math. Wait a minute, is this unicorn math? Is this Thor hammer math? Wait a minute, no, it's, it's flat, whoa, what, flat, non-rotating flat earth math. Oh, then it, oh, I'm sorry. Could we just substitute Pegasus, unicorns? No, exactly. Let's keep going. Here's another one. Closed form solution for ballistic vehicle motion. Ballistic vehicle motion. A closed form solution is developed for the motion of a ballistic vehicle entering the atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating earth. Frank J. Barbera, Cayman Sciences Corporation, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Closed form solution for ballistic vehicle motion. Meaning we got to know where this thing's going to come down. And what does it say right here? Entering the atmosphere over a non-rotating flat earth. Let's end this. Uh, here's another one. Vision-based mobile target geolocalization -loca and target discrimination using Bayes detection theory. Oh, <laughs> A mouthful, right? Mm -hmm. This is a more modern, I can't remember the year on this one, but anyway, you see this is the uh, Academy Center for the United States uh, Air Force, um, U.S. Air Force Academy, UA, UAS Research, and this is for um, targeting for unmanned vehicles, unmanned vehicle, aerial vehicles targeting manual. Yes? Oh, yeah, this one does have his email on it. <coughs> All of them, there's a string of them. <laughs> Check them out. Here we go. Check it out here. The objective of geolocalization uh, problem is to estimate range to target, which can be estimated using the flat earth model shown in figure two. Now, let me explain something to you. I'm, I, I play a little golf in my day, right? And I know that I hit a nine iron 160 yards on a normal day. So if the ground is level, I know if I hit my nine iron the correct way, it's going to fly in a nice little arc and it's going to land about 160 yards right on the green and roll right up to the hole. Okay. I've done, I've actually made an eagle that way one time. All right. So I know. So. If the ground is 20 yards higher, say the green is 20 yards higher from where I'm standing, so you change the altitude. The ball is not going to fly in the air as long, so it's not going to go as far. So if it's a little higher, I have to go to an 8-iron. Back it up, so because I'm going to hit an 8-iron or even a 7-iron, so the ball will get there. It's the opposite if it's lower by say 20 yards and I usually have to back up a couple of clubs and maybe hit a pitching wedge. So it changes where that my you know where my ball is going to land the target. I'm shooting at that pin at that green but I know just the slight changes in elevation are going to change the distance that my ball will travel and I've hit enough balls with those clubs to know how far they're going to go if I hit them right. Huh? So we're talking about here unmanned aerial vehicles targeting objects. Stuff that's moving in the air and on the ground. And what do they say? It says the objective of geolocalization problem is to estimate range to target which can be estimated using the flat earth model shown in figure two which would be this little thing right here. No curve. Do you notice the flat earth model? <laughs> and your little aerial craft locating a target. Now if this line was curved here, as it does eight inches per mile squared, that line is going to intersect at a different point. I'm not a geometry teacher, but that I know. Maybe it's just from golf, right? Flat Earth model, range estimation using Flat Earth assumption. 
Unmanned Vehicle Targeting Manual from Research Gate, but of course we showed you, United States Air Force Academy. Does everybody see that? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What if I had a flat earth model on my desk? I'd be called a nut! Crazy! You know what? Maybe the Lord's having me show you. Because you know what? I think one of the things they're going to try to do to some of us Christians that if we believe in biblical cosmology and flat earth, I believe that they're going to try to say we're crazy and try to take our kids away and stuff like that. Having these documents in court would be a powerful tool, wouldn't they? Now, if they would be a powerful tool in court against the government, Why are they not a powerful tool right now in church? 